Do Christians need to go to church? This is a common question many have. Sometimes a question is an honest question, and sometimes a question is posed by hostile skeptics. St. Augustine has a memorable answer to this question in his testimonial book, Confessions, which we will later discuss. And we will reflect on some questions that are just as interesting, such as, why should I attend a church? Which type of church should I attend? My internet persona is purposely vague as to which denomination I call home. There are many respectful channels out there that compare themselves to other Christians, and this isn't one of them. I am respectful of all legitimate Judeo-Christian traditions, seeking moral truths where I find them, including moral and Stoic philosophy. So, the first question I ask is always, is the question properly framed? And is the question itself absurd? So let's reframe the question in another context. We know that all the major college football teams have booster clubs. My barber many years ago was a lady who was a rabid Seminoles fan, and when you walked into her shop, you would think you'd walked into a football memorabilia museum with autographed posters of football players and coaches and banners and footballs and helmets, and she was enthusiastically talking about all the games. She drove all the way to Tallahassee so she could hoot and holler in the stands. Now, clearly, these football boosters never asked these questions. Why should I go to the Seminole football games? Couldn't I be a true Seminole booster without going to the games? The questions are simply absurd. So why wouldn't it also be absurd for Christians to ask why they have to go to church if they're truly Christian? So let us ask the question in another way. You have no doubt heard the often told joke. What's the difference between those who go to the beach on Sundays and those who go to church on Sundays? The answer is that those who go to the beach on Sundays don't go to church on Sundays because they don't think they need to change. While the people who go to church on Sundays think that they don't need to change neither because they go to church. And to be truthful, we really do not want a Jesus who expects us to help him carry his cross. We want a Jesus who takes the cross off our back. We want a Jesus who makes us happy. But the ugly truth about life is, if we truly try to live a godly life, sometimes we will be happy, and sometimes not so much. And to recast the message in our joke, people generally do not want to commit to a church or synagogue because they do not want a God who tells them how to live their life. But when we commit to living a godly life, we prefer to recast our God and his message in a God that tells us what we want to hear. And you can see this in our channel views. One of our projects is to reflect on the teachings and scriptures and the church fathers and the moral philosophers on the Ten Commandments. By far, these videos are the least popular videos on our channel. People always want to believe that they root for the winning football team, and likewise, enthusiastic converts always want to argue that their denomination are the only true Christians. And these polemic videos are the videos that draw the views. Now, we believe in a stoic view of Christianity that Christ did not die on the cross to relieve us of our sufferings. Christ died on the cross to show us how to endure our sufferings. And Christ can give us the strength to deal with our sufferings if we but ask Christ to grant us the strength. Now, what do the scriptures exhort us to do? This is always a primary concern. Hebrews in the New Testament has the clearest instruction. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. What exactly does it mean to encourage one another? We'll ponder this question further. And there are other Bible verses commonly cited that encourage us to attend church, and this is one good list. And there are also several Psalms that clearly state how we should long to be close to God. Psalms 84 explicitly pines to be in the house of the Lord. It begins, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. And the intervening verses are also beautiful. The psalm concludes, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor, and no good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Now this psalm is also named the janitor psalm proclaiming it would be better to be a janitor in the house of the Lord than to be a VIP amongst the ungodly. Also beautiful is Psalm 42. 
As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O Lord. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? And this psalm was written for someone who is in exile in a foreign land, whose captors taunt him, who longs to return to the land of the house of the Lord. Later the psalmist sings, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? We remember how Jesus cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the psalmist sings, As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me when they say to me continually, Where is your God? Why are you cast down on my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? But there's an upbeat note, as there are in many of these psalms. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. And St. Augustine reflects on this psalm. Let us burn together with thirst. Let us run together to the fountain of understanding. Let us long for it as a heart yearns for a spring. Let us long for the wellspring of which scripture exhorts. With you is the fountain of life. Long for the fountains of water, with God as the fountain of life, a fountain that can never dry up. God is everything that will refresh you. He is able to fill anyone who comes to him. That's what I am thirsting for, to, to reach him and appear before him. I am thirsty on my pilgrimage, parched in my running, but I will be totally satisfied when I arrive. St. Augustine's memorable reflection on our question appears in the Confessions, which is really one of the first testimonials. St. Augustine tells us of the story of Victorinus, a philosopher who studies the Gospels in the Church Fathers, but declines to attend services, asking, do the walls of the Church make you a Christian? Victorinus was a learned man, an arid pagan Platonic philosopher, and the word of the Lord spoke directly to him from the page. Perhaps he felt intellectually superior to the many simple Christians he knew. But in the words of St. Augustine in his studies, Victorinus became resolute. He was seized by the fear that Christ might deny him before the holy angels if he was too faint-hearted to acknowledge Christ before men, and he found himself guilty of a great crime and being ashamed of the sacraments instituted by the word of God in his lowly state. So God did speak to Victorinus in his heart, and the answer is that the walls of the church do make you a Christian. Your public profession of faith is what makes you a member of the church and a Christian. So, what kind of church should you seek? And in the 5th century, St. John Climacus wrote the Ladder of Divine Ascent, and it's one of the few monastic manuals that give advice to the young monk on how to select the abbot and monastery whose guidance he will follow. Now, ancient monasteries were like a spiritual boot camp. Monks are expected to follow the spiritual advice of their abbot without question. Now, of course, you need to allegorize this advice when you apply it to your life as a layman. St. John Climacus teaches us, if we are prudent, we should test our helmsman, meaning our priest or pastor, so as not to mistake the sailor for the pilot, a sick man for a doctor, a passionate for a dispassionate man, the sea for a harbor, and so bring about the speedy shipwreck for our soul. But once we've entered the arenas of piety and obedience, we must no longer judge our good manager in any way at all, even though we may perhaps see in him some slight failings, since he is only human. Otherwise, by sitting in judgment, we shall not profit from our obedience. In other words, our primary criteria in determining what church we should attend, in accordance to the teachings of St. John Climacus, is that we will trust the moral precepts of the preacher and be willing to follow his advice. Now, laymen cannot be closely directed by their priests or pastors like monks are by their spiritual fathers or abbots because laymen usually do not live out their daily life with their priests or pastors. But laymen need to be comfortable with the spirituality of their priest or pastor. If your priest or pastor tells you truth that needs to be heard that you do not like, you should still listen. And if they ask you to change your ways in a way you may not like, you should be very reluctant to go against their advice. This advice is more applicable to those Christians who see confession as a sacrament, and that includes the Catholic and the Orthodox, but this can also be applicable when you seek spiritual counseling for your marriage or other life problems, indeed even for secular marriage counseling. When you select a church, moral teaching, and your respect for your pastor or priest in his moral teachings is far more important than convenience or music ministries or whether you feel spiritually fed or entertained. Another implication is, if you wish to develop a deep faith, study and reflection is needed. 
One observation of mine is that when somebody wishes to convert from their current faith tradition to another, their understanding of their faith tradition into which they were born is fragmentary, which makes it far easier for them to bash what they left. Now, those who choose to study their own tradition often choose not to convert. And likewise, you should study the tradition you are considering converting to. We can also profit from reflections in Eve Congar's book, True and False Reform in the Church, that encouraged Pope John XXIII to call the Second Vatican Council. Soon after World War II, there was deep dissatisfaction in the Catholic Church, a sense that the Church was on the wrong side of history. Eve Congar reflected on the role that the Church should play in our lives, the lives of believers, and his reflections are valid whether you're Catholic or not. He reflects that, like Jesus, the Church that is the bridegroom of Jesus is both human and divine which means that the church is simultaneously imperfect and infallible. And also he reflects on how the church is much larger than any individual clergyman and how in ancient times the church as a whole was far less likely to be judged by the imperfections of one or a few individuals. Eve Congar quotes St. Augustine, Whenever in my books I speak of the church having neither spot nor wrinkle, as Ephesians exhorts us, it is necessary to understand this is not as if the church was already like this, but in the sense that she is preparing herself to be on the day when she will appear in her glory. At present, by reason of the ignorance and infirmity of her members, she has reason to say every day, Forgive us our debts. And Eve Congar also quotes St. Ephraim, The whole church is the church of penitence, and the whole church is the church of those who are perishing. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.